Studio uh, Gruber in 2006 uh, after some important uh, working experience uh, uh, and his work has been widely published uh, and exhibited international, supported by the Grant Foundation uh, and other very important uh, grants uh, and fellowships. Um, I have to say that uh, what I very much uh, like about Stefan and maybe this, the reason why we invited him to speak uh, to our seminar, the, the, the times, the occasions I have to uh, I had to read him uh, and to, uh, let's say, listen to him. I was very impressed by the clarity uh, that he has in addressing uh, the very complex, uh, let's say, discussion on uh, commoning uh, and, and the common. Uh, of course, commoning is a very important uh, way for Stefan to uh, enter the whole uh, discussion. Um, also, the other reason is because uh, there is a number, um, there are a number of uh, PhD uh, dissertations uh, uh, in our program that, in a way, tackle uh, this issue. Actually, not only PhD dissertation, but also uh, studio uh, programs and syllabus. So, I think uh, uh, I thought that uh, it was uh, wonderful, uh, let's say, to have uh, Stefan with us because I'm sure he will really help us to navigate uh, this very complex discussion about uh, commoning from both the point of view of political economy, uh, but also from the point of view of special practices. And of course, last but not least, uh, another very important motivation for me to have Stefan exactly <laughs> In these uh, circumstances, uh, uh, I think one of the most unfortunate uh, byproduct of the situation in which we are is the circulation of certain uh, tropes, uh, one of them social distancing, uh, uh, which uh, unfortunately is now transcending uh, it's, uh, let's say, more kind of medical uh, uh, condition and, and uh, it's almost assuming the, the, the power of a kind of metaphor uh, for something that I myself feel very sinister and, 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 very, and very negative in general. And I thought that uh, commoning and especially the idea of care, which is a very important uh, aspect uh, of the way in which uh, Stefan addressed uh, commoning, uh, uh, it's really a reminder that uh, uh, what is at stake is not just, a, 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 let's say, a, a medical problem, which of course is very important, but it's also all the implications uh, of uh, this medical problem that has uh, with care, with lack of uh, access to uh, decent forms of welfare, uh, all things that in a way in the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 years of neoliberal uh, economy have been systematically uh, destroy. And in fact, the reason why commoning and common has become, again, a very important topic was also in reaction to this, let's say, dismantling uh, of social uh, infrastructure. So I think uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very important time to really address uh, uh, these issues. And I'm very, very happy that Stefan uh, is with us. So he will give actually a presentation uh, um, of approximately uh, one hour, if I'm not uh, uh, wrong, uh, more or less, uh, let's say. And then uh, we will have uh, uh, time, uh, let's say 40 minutes, uh, something like that, uh, of questions. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure, I hope and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and also uh, comments from PhD candidates uh, and, of course, uh, the guests who are joining us uh, this afternoon. So. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Uh, and uh, the, the digital uh, floor <laughs> is, uh, is yours. <laughs> Great. Thanks, thanks Pierre Vittori, uh, Vittorio. Um, thanks for the introduction and the invitation to share uh, my work with you. Um, as, as PV just mentioned, I, I recently had the opportunity to spend uh, four days at uh, Yale, first in person and then remotely uh, discussing the the amazing work that both uh, Territorios and Tatiana Bilbao Studio uh, were both kind of working on the commons. And it's, um, it's incredibly encouraging to see how the commons debate is beginning to enter architectural discourse and affect future generations of architects. So um, I, I, I'm kind of uh, thankful for the opportunity to contribute to that endeavor here uh, today with you. Um, 
My interest in um, the commons began to crystallize in 2014 when I uh, co-organized an international uh, summer school entitled Commoning the City uh, at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, where I was based at that time. Uh, 40 participants or so, um, and a really kind of incredible group of contributors, including uh, Silvia Federici, Stavros Davridis, uh, Chantal Mouffe, and others, uh, joined for a week of workshops and uh, debates. And this experience was uh, really catalytic for me as it opened up new perspectives on uh, the possibility of uh, thinking about the co production of the city uh, beyond contemporary forms of domination. Um, this summer school was embedded in a, in a kind of multi-year research project entitled Spaces of Commoning that uh, brought together an interdisciplinary group from a wide range of disciplines, including sociologists, urban geographers, artists, and uh, also architects. But while the project was deliberately framed around the study of uh, spaces of commoning, so exploring spaces both as a resource and uh, a place in which commoning unfolds, in that group, architecture was met with a profound skepticism. And so um, my newly gained hope seemed kind of instantly dashed. Um, in effect, uh, you know, while the commons have moved uh, to the center of debates on more equitable cities, uh, more often than not, it seems architects are, are siding with the dark sides of urbanization. Um, amongst many reasons, architecture's dependence on large investments makes it naturally complicit with prevailing powers. Um, as a result, contemporary architecture is increasingly reduced uh, either to commodity and generic urban developments, uh, as you see on one side of the slide, um, or instead to signature icons uh, competing for symbolic capital in a global attention economy, um, which you see on, on, on the other end. By no means uh, do, kind of, do I wash my hands in innocence. In my early career, I worked with Dylan Scofidio on, uh, amongst others, the, the Highline project that you see uh, uh, here. Um, which in many ways has become the kind of uh, the case study for gentrification on steroids. Um, so what opportunities exist then for alternative practices of architecture that operate in the cracks, eluding the influence of uh, market or the state? If indeed we shape our buildings and they in turn shape us, uh, how can architecture be more than a vehicle for reproducing existing power structures and instead contribute to renegotiating social relations. In short, can contemporary architecture ever be an emancipatory project? Um, the quest for affirmative answers to these questions um, has guided my research and design practice for the past few years. And thus, rather than kind of turning my back on architecture, the challenges and dilemmas brought out by my work with the Spaces of Commoning Group made me really kind of want to return to architecture even more and investigate the possibility of alternative modes of practice. This also uh, led me to collaborate on the exhibition uh, and publication project, An Atlas of Commoning, um, that uh, Evie already kind of mentioned in the introduction and that I would like to reflect on today. Um, An Atlas of Commoning is a long-term traveling exhibition by IFAR, the German Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations, uh, and in collaboration with Eichplus, which is, um, you know, one of, I would say, well, Germany's leading architectural journal uh, on architectural and urbanism discourse. Um, and here I'd like to also kind of shout out to Anne No, Christian Hiller, and all the kind of other members uh, of uh, the Eichplus team who invited me to co-curate the exhibition and guest edit um, this uh, accompanying uh, issue. Um, last but, but not least, the research um, that led to the Atlas was developed in a seminar and studio over the course of a couple of years uh, with students from the Masters of Urban Design here at Carnegie Mellon University. And so in many ways, the making of this exhibition uh, you know, was a kind of intense and uh, huge collaborative endeavor uh, that I think uh, also resonates with the idea of uh, pooling resources and kind of um, contributing uh, at many different uh, capacities. Um, 
The exhibition, An Atlas of Commoning, assembles grassroots initiatives in which citizens come together, uh, pooling resources in order to transform and claim their right to the city. In response to uh, the growing realization that neither the state nor the market, um, at least in their current uh, neoliberal manifestation, uh, support the even distribution access to resources, uh, communities the world over are taking matters into their own hands in pursuit of a more sustainable, open, and solidary life. And um, the project assembled in an atlas of commoning demonstrate how citizen-led projects uh, rendered seemingly marginal by dominant market measures are in fact instrumental in building urban resilience. More importantly, the, 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 the exhibition uh, and the project show um, that um, these alternatives are already in the making, so they're not just a kind of, uh, kind of a, uh, a hopeful kind of uh, projection. And together, when kind of seen um, as a network, they already constitute a critical mass. Their co collective spatial practices outline the possibilities of reframing the city as commons. And this is, in a way, the kind of uh, the key hypothesis uh, with which we um, started this project. Now, let me just kind of attempt to at least give a kind of a concise uh, definition of our commoning. Um, commoning are collective practices uh, structured around the production and stewardship of shared resources. Commoners form self-defined communities by actively engaging in the governance of material or immaterial common goods and negotiating rules of access and use. Thus, beyond a mere natural resources to be found, extracted, uh, and consumed, commons are an ongoing social practice. Um, and Peter Leinbach has coined this term commoning, uh, and he argues that there is no commons without commoning. Hence, our use of the act is active variables in the title of the exhibition. And lastly, although um, often driven by everyday needs, commoning aims at a paradigm shift, a systems level change. But as to be expected, um, the processes of uh, emancipation from prevalent power structures and the articulation of a common ground beyond individual interest is never free of friction. And I would argue that it is precisely in the process of encountering and negotiating differences that practices of commoning unfold. Um, so it is inherently kind of an agonistic uh, kind of um, uh, practice. Um, accordingly, the exhibition is structured around three axes of investigations or three axes of tensions, uh, each one illustrating the, this, this, this negotiation inherent in practices of sharing. Um, these three axes are ownership axes, uh, productive and reproductive labor, and uh, solidarity and rights. Ownership axis um, addresses questions of property with a special focus on land ownership in the face of rampant commodification of the urban environment. Uh, production reproduction challenges the modernist separation of functions with respect to the domestic and productive sphere, and uh, really tries to shed light onto new collective forms of working and housing beyond the paradigm of the 20th centuries that was founded on gendered policies of domestic labor. And uh, thirdly, uh, rights and solidarity explore the notions of universal rights in the context of global capitalism and discusses new models of governance that extend beyond the boundaries of the nation state. These axes of tensions define a contested field in which a, a range of competing ideologies claim and uh, reclaim the commons. Now, uh, the spectrum of uh, projects featured in the exhibition span from the German Mietshäuser Syndicate, uh, a tenement syndicate um, that is uh, working towards permanently uh, removing residential property from the real estate market, to um, the Yoshina Sida House, a project initiated by Airbnb in rural Japan in which the care work of a village community is wrestling with uh, the logics of uh, platform capitalism and corporate uh, philanthropy. So by no means are we only featuring kind of ideal or idealized projects um, in the exhibition, on the contrary. And in the face of these contrary, uh, contrasting uh, positions, um, the Atlas of Commoning doesn't attempt to give a singular definition of commoning, 
but rather it seeks to portray its struggle. Uh, if the commons are understood as a social relationship negotiating, uh, negotiated in an ongoing uh, process, where competing communities redefine access, usage, and signification, then the spaces um, that serve the making of these new relations um, have to necessarily engage in an ongoing negotiation of power, of hierarchies, and of mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion. In effect, in if it is in the negotiation between the declared goals of these groups and the messiness of everyday life that um, we argue uh, the characters of commoning emerge. Now, um, the exhibition was shown in uh, Berlin first and then uh, in Pittsburgh uh, here uh, on CMU's campus and will continue to, uh, to travel the world for uh, eight years um, if borders open up again. <laughs> Uh, last week, it was actually uh, supposed to open in Mexico City, which, you know, of course, um, got canceled or at least postponed. Um, but the original um, show is organized around uh, 25 initial uh, projects um, that uh, are arranged in what we call the Atlas that forms the kind of centerpiece uh, of the exhibition that you see here. Uh, but to which local projects uh, will be added in each host city. So it's really um, the idea of a kind of open and growing uh, knowledge archive, um, which we, we in a way produce a kind of, or, or provide a framework for. Uh, in addition to selected uh, cases, um, are featured more in detail through large-scale architectural and interactive models that were um, developed uh, and built by students of the Technical University in Berlin uh, under the guidance of Rainer Hehl. Um, and uh, a series of videos that uh, feature interviews with commoners um, that speak about the, the, the actual practice. Uh, as well as thematic islands that position the case that is in a broader historical and also societal context. Um, and finally, a handful of artistic positions uh, offer a more visceral entry point um, into aspects of commoning. Uh, here you see Manuel Herz's right on carpet, a carpet inscribed with the declarations of human rights. And um, as you can see on this uh, uh, photo, the carpet also doubles as an event space in the exhibition. So as you access the carpet and enact the ritual of removing your show shoes and bending down, you are also invited to engage with the actual um, wording uh, of these universal declarations. The idea of uh, the atlas uh, was inspired by Abi Warburg's uh, Nemosin Atlas. Um, in which he visually juxtaposed diverse artworks, uh, aiming at uh, teasing out um, differences and commonalities. The display uh, offers endless possibilities uh, and kind of possible uh, associations, uh, but maybe more importantly, um, it can be reconfigured and create new relations as additional projects are added. Um, as a result, each iteration of the Atlas uh, will be a snapshot in an open and continuous uh, process that, again, kind of reflects on this uh, notion of ongoing negotiation and the co-production of cities on the one hand, but also the co-production of knowledge. Um, this is why uh, it is also called an Atlas and not the Atlas. Uh, it's one of many possible Atlases to come. Um, and um, we see that the atlas in its initial arrangement uh, then as a mere kind of starting point and as an invitation for um, the definition of spaces and practices of commoning to be reframed and also even decentered according to uh, the respective uh, diverse cultural context uh, in which uh, the exhibition uh, will be shown. But the fragmented nature of um, the kind of ongoing struggles, both in spatial and ideological terms, also raise the question about how to move beyond singular agendas in order to com constitute common interests. I, I believe that this is one of the dilemmas of the kind of left, in a way, that has produced such a kind of fragmented landscape. And so one of the questions is, you know, um, how the seemingly disparate spaces of urban and commoning add up to more than the sum of its part and can form a translocal network without sacrificing their autonomy or falling uh, 
victim to a totalizing vision. That's that's why we were very cautious about kind of you know pushing forward a kind of a singular agenda or a singular definition of commoning. Now, um, in the following, I will attempt to tease out a few principles um, that hold this project together uh, and share preliminary findings from assembling this atlas. So um, I will illustrate these points with uh, projects that are featured in the exhibition, as well as some of the readings that you know, helped me, helped us uh, frame um, the work. Uh, and that uh, also led to assemble this small library that we added uh, in the Pittsburgh iteration of the exhibition that you see here next to the carpet. So uh, let me begin with the kind of the basics. Um, private does not equal public, does not equal the commons. And yet this architecture's imagination still seems to be stuck in a binary thinking that uh, opposes public versus private space. The commons uh, perspective challenges this dichotomy by introducing a third sphere. In this regard, the commons cautions us also from the notion of the public beyond nostalgic projections of an idealized past when public space thrived and social negotiations seemed uh, intact. And the distinction between uh, private, public, and commons in ter turn urges us to uh, ask more difficult questions. Who owns the city? Uh, who produces the city and who benefits from it. Uh, we are probably all familiar with Jane Jacobs' description of New York City's casual interaction between strangers that make our neighborhoods safe. These are our everyday modes of co-producing the city, and yet only selected few capitalize uh, on this collective production. Uh, according to Henri Lefebvre, the right to co-produce the city constitutes a fundamental human right. And David Harvey underlines that that right, um, and I quote him here, is a collective rather than an individual right, since reinventing the city is uh, inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power over the processes of urbanization, end of quote. Now, in an ideal uh, diagram, these uh, three spheres that I have described are in balance. Um, since the 1980s, however, uh, cities have gradually moved from a redistributive to an entrepreneur entrepreneurial mode of governing. As a result, rather than acting as an agent for the common good, in many instances, the state has become a vehicle of the market. Nonetheless, within the debate of the common, I think the status of uh, the state is highly contested um, as an apparatus to be reclaimed, as suggested by David Harvey, or on the opposite of the spectrum as uh, something to be rejected, according to Michael Hart. In effect, the relationship between the state and the market, public and private, is one that turns and twists. And as a result, we find ourselves with all kinds of um, public-private partnerships, uh, such as this privately uh, owned public park uh, or publicly owned parks that are privately operated. Um, but where are the public-common partnerships? According to Stavros Stavridis, in common space, space is produced and used as commons, and I quote him here, people do not simply use an area given by an authority, local state, state, public institution, etc. they actually mold this kind of space according to their collective needs and aspirations. Common space happens and is shaped through collective action." End of quote. Now, one such example um, was El Campo de Cebada in Madrid. Um, when the lack of municipal funding uh, halted the reconstruction of a public center, a sports center, and left um, this gaping cement hole where a swimming pool once stood, neighbors began uh, kind of claiming this, uh, the site as a community space. Equipped with uh, paint, uh, recycled materials, and gardening tools, they built a new city square, um, which was designed by and for the people, um, and maybe as a result of that really boasted a whole set of uh, activities uh, that many urban designers would only kind of dream of. Uh, 
Most importantly, events and ideas for change uh, were discussed in weekly assemblies. Decisions were made by cons consensus and kind of uh, administered in um, dedicated committees. Um, so the occupation of uh, public uh, squares and the transformation into laboratories of self-governance and direct democracies um, became um, catalytic in mobilizing and unifying citizens across uh, Spain to come together and take over local city governments uh, in an attempt to rebuild trust in democratic institutions and uh, return decision-making uh, to the, the, the people. So we, 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 we witnessed uh, here how, in a way, a much more kind of bottom-up uh, and ad hoc initiative uh, became a, a vehicle to kind of um, reclaim, in a way, or reappropriate uh, also the institutions uh, of the state uh, uh, that led to uh, a global uh, movement uh, referred to as, as the municipalist uh, movement that was really kind of committed to expand the commons and uh, re-municipalize basic uh, services and also feminize politics. Another less um, informal example of a common space is Ruthless, um, the Palestine refugee uh, in, in the ref uh, uh, Palestine refugee camp of Al Fabar. Uh, although its residents have lived in the camp for three generations, um, any physical traces of settling down are seen as jeopardizing their hopes for returning to um, their homeland. Their political resistance to accepting the status quo or to kind of embrace ordinary life renders any act of planning or building with very kind of complex uh, contradictions. Nonetheless, Ruthless engaged uh, in the implausible process of co-creating a public square in the camp. And um, as a result, the community was prompted to imagine its future while challenging prevailing social relations. So as much as a, as a, as a result, the, 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 this, this plaza uh, raised questions both about the normalization uh, of life in the camp but also, um, I think, exposed or kind of um, you know, it revealed uh, it, 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 its political uh, reality. What is considered private is not really private uh, because uh, the homes are not registered as private property. And what is defined as public is also not really public because neither the host government nor the residents themselves recognize these as such. Um, but without private or public ownership, who is responsible for ma maintaining a shared uh, space of, 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 of the plaza? And who defines the rules of its use and access? For instance, will the women who um, advocated for the plaza initially, uh, will, will they gain the right to gather in the space for coffee and, 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 and tea? Uh, Sandy Hilal and, and Alessandro Petty uh, with the architectural studio and art residency program DAAR, which stands for Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency, have accompanied this process for seven years. And their design translate the negotiations inherent in ambiguities into architecture. Uh, the plaza uh, is surrounded by walls in order to preserve the privacy of neighboring homes. And as a result, the plaza is rendered as roofless house. And the state of incompleteness, or its state of incompleteness, sustains uh, the refugees' refusal to settle uh, permanently. But a house as an open plaza also flips the figure uh, of the home inside out, implicitly transferring familiar patterns of domestic behavior into the realm of a new communal space. The plaza as public living room proposes a common space beyond the kind of unavailing notions of private or public. Now, inevitably, the commons uh, lead us to the question of ownership. Um, and maybe even for those who are less familiar with the commons discourse, uh, you will likely have encountered the so-called tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons refers to a, an essay or scenario in which a commonly held land is inevitably inevitably depleting um, depleted uh, when individuals act uh, independently and in their own self-interest um, and for instance allow their livestock to graze and kind of uh, degrade um, 
uh, the kind of uh, natural uh, uh, resource. It was popularized uh, by the wildlife biologist Garrett Hardin that you see here in a famous essay uh, written exactly 50 years ago. But this parable um, was often kind of instrumentalized to claim that the only solution to this strategy is either privatization uh, of a resource or uh, uh, as an alternative government control and a kind of a top-down regulation. Meanwhile, economist Eleanor Ostrom uh, has demonstrated the flaws of Hardin's uh, argument. And through decades of research, she proved that how local communities around the world avoid this strategy uh, through the formation of institutions that are collectively designed, monitored, and enforced. Um, Ostrom argued that the tragedy of the commons omitted to take into consideration the collective practices and social contracts, implicit or explicit, that function as a guarantor for sustainable resource management. And uh, her work uh, on alternative economics eventually earned her a Nobel Prize uh, in economics. In her book, Governing the Commons, she argues that by forming institutions that follow eight principles, um, communities achieve some of the most sustainable stewardship of common pool resources. But while Ostrom's work focused on natural re resources, um, such as water, grazing land, or fisheries, um, in an urban age in which soon 75% uh, of the world uh, lives in cities, how do we apply her principles uh, to urban commons? In many ways, cities have always been uh, the gateway uh, to accessing uh, resources and opportunities through the, through the surplus accumulation of capital. But they are also the site where inequity becomes most manifest. And uh, I would argue this is the tragedy of uh, our current economic uh, model. Um, in his seminal work, Capital in, in the 21st Century, Thomas Piketty, the French um, economist, demonstrates how the pure rate of return on capital has risen much faster than the rate of growth since the 1980s and led to an exponential wealth gap uh, that is unlikely to self-correct. The data demonstrates that rising inequity is systemic to the working of neoliberal capitalism and unless markets are regulated and we tackle questions of social polarization in cities any other efforts towards sustainable urban developments will be made in, in, in vain but what other mechanisms exist uh, for seeing cities neighborhoods and homes uh, through the lens of their use value and the well-being of the communities they serve instead of and investment vehicles uh, in the real estate market. Vilma 19 is uh, one of 128 collective housing projects across Germany uh, that constitute uh, the Mietzhäuser Syndicate, Syndicate, the Tenement Syndicate. The syndicate uh, provides a model for self-organized living based on a solidarity economy. Um, its decentralized structure renders uh, the, the reselling of property nearly impossible and stabilizes rents below market rate while empowering tenants within autonomous projects to collectively determine how they would like to live. Uh, maybe similar to a community land trust, uh, the syndicate uh, distributes power onto two sub subordinate bodies that mutually monitor one another. And uh, the, the diagram in the foreground uh, tries to kind of, um, kind of explain this relationship. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the decentralized uh, structure aims at providing maximum autonomy to local projects. So each house is uh, self-organized and managed by its tenants. Uh, and this uh, kind of on a, on a financial and legal level, that, that autonomy is also uh, a way to protect the other project in case of insolvency. But on the other hand, um, the, the, the structure uh, provides mutual support for projects within the network, especially in the founding phase. Uh, by agreeing to a fixed rent, uh, even after all the older projects have paid off their mortgage, the syndicate is able to financially back new projects and therefore, there's a kind of a, uh, the, a logic of kind of exponential growth uh, kind of built into uh, the, the, the network 
which also ad addresses uh, one of the kind of central questions about uh, practice of carboning, that is about scaling up, that maybe we can talk about uh, in the Q&A. Um, the conversion of a former East German Secret Service office building uh, in this kind of prefabricated, uh, typical kind of um, um, prefabricated concrete uh, kind of um, systems uh, building, uh, building systems uh, in, in Berlin's uh, Lichtenberg district, I think make uh, Wilma 19 an architecturally striking example uh, of, of uh, for a Mietshäuser syndicate uh, a house. Uh, you can imagine that, uh, I mean, not only was this building not uh, kind of architecturally not attractive uh, in kind of common real estate terms, but also its, its difficult history made it uh, uh, problematic. Um, now, the, the precast concrete panel construction uh, kind of di dictated a kind of a very rigid layout of 20 identical rooms light up, lined up along a, a, a double loaded corridor on each floor. And in order to create communal spaces here, structural walls had to be um, uh, broken through literally and uh, metaphorically. One similar but more common model of uh, shared ownership is the limited equity cooperative housing model or kind of co-ops in which members hold uh, democratic control. So in a co-op, each cooperative member casts one vote uh, compared to a corporation where shareholders with many shares in a way have uh, greater decision-making powers. Um, especially against the backdrop of rising rents and uh, kind of uh, swelling real estate uh, prices, cooperative housing is experiencing a, a real kind of uh, boom in cities like Zurich, Berlin, and Vienna. Uh, and I think here cooperative housing offers a kind of an interesting alternative to either house ownership uh, or rent as a kind of a, again, a, a binary um, opposition. Um, Switzerland in particular has a long tradition of cooperative housing that goes back uh, to uh, the kind of uh, First World War. Uh, and uh, here you see a, a, an image uh, of Hannes Meyer's uh, Freidorf settlement. Uh, that he uh, completed uh, before uh, becoming the second director of uh, the, the Bauhaus uh, in, in Dessau. Um, but while many of the kind of initial uh, Swiss cooperative uh, housing projects were actually situated in the countryside or kind of on the, on, on the edge of cities, uh, more recently they have moved uh, to the centers. Uh, and on this map, you see uh, a kind of, uh, uh, the, 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 the series of, uh, uh, of 5,000 units uh, that were of cooperative housing projects uh, that were built in Zurich uh, between 2004 and 2014. I think this gives you also a sense that, you know, these, these, these uh, citizen-led uh, projects uh, in, in, in some cases really have the capacity uh, to scale up and, and, and begin to have a kind of a more systemic uh, impact uh, on the housing market uh, and so on. And um, here I will kind of just zap through a series of impressions uh, from uh, kind of, uh, you know, our field work to uh, just give you a, a bit of a, a sense of both the, the quantity, but also the quality of these projects in which citizens were really kind of the, the, the drivers in, in coming together and um, shaping the built environment according to their individual or collective uh, kind of uh, need, needs and also uh, aspirations or hopes. Now, beyond the collective, uh, uh, the, the idea of collective ownership, these housing projects also offer additional opportunities for pooling resources. One such example is the Spreefeld Co-op in Berlin. Uh, and here, 150 residents live in uh, three buildings that are characterized by reduced private dwelling in exchange for extra shared facilities. Uh, in this diagram, uh, you see uh, the kind of uh, the distribution of both uh, private spaces and communal spaces that are accessible to all. Uh, many actually are open uh, to uh, not just the residents, but the neighborhood at large. Uh, 
and they include a kind of a you know a, a, a wood workshop, a, a large commercial kitchen uh, uh, with sort of an event space, uh, a daycare, and even a boathouse. Uh, and so they, those residents actually speak of uh, a notion of collective luxury that does not necessarily come at the expense of higher rents. Uh, in fact, um, you know, there's this kind of trade-off where residents are willing to reduce their individual uh, space in exchange for an abundance uh, of uh, our communal uh, facilities. And for some, uh, the same logic is replicated at a smaller scale, at the scale of dwellings in so-called cluster units. Uh, Cluster living offers uh, 15 to 20 residents the possibility to live together and still be able to retreat to an individual private uh, studio with a, a kind of a small bath and kitchenette. But the cluster spatial differentiation really allows for kind of a, a much more gradient or gradual degrees of uh, sharing. Now, from an environmental standpoint, these new forms of sharing offer an opportunity for more resource-friendly, uh, kind of a more resource-friendly resource existence uh, compared to, you know, the American dream um, in which uh, prosperity is measured through the accumulation and ownership of stuff. And I think Spreefeld and many other cooperatives are indicative of a, a broader trend in which people are shedding the material burdens of ownership and are shifting. Uh, towards accessing um, experiences uh, or resources uh, on demand. Partly due to ubiquitous technologies, uh, the instant access to ideas, goods, and services open up, I think, a whole range of new possibilities of uh, sharing that is not necessarily kind of uh, associated with personal uh, sacrifice. But at the same time, the current transformation of uh, sharing in platform into kind of platform capitalism uh, also comes at the risk of turning all life into a paid for experience. Uh, as we all know, the so-called sharing economy is exasperating precarious working condition and sharpening the social divide. And the commodification of every aspect of life um, denies a growing part of society access to resources that are essential for survival. Um, and especially in the urban settings, uh, housing uh, has become such a uh, scarce uh, resource. Now, um, the question then becomes how citizens can reclaim the benefits uh, from the new economies of sharing and gain control over the access to basic resources. And resonating with cooperative uh, housing, there's, I think, really fascinating, many kind of uh, fascinating discussions around platform cooperative, cooperative cooperatives uh, that uh, are advocating for commons-based peer-to-peer versions of sharing platform, such as Uber or uh, Airbnb. Uh, so for instance, Airbnb um, splits its commission and reinvests half of its, uh, of um, the kind of the, um, the, the platform uh, fee into local community projects in, in, in an attempt to, in a way, attenuate or kind of uh, compensate for the negative effects uh, that, that Airbnb has had uh, on inner cities. Ultimately, the key question is uh, who holds decision-making powers? Today, citizens' participation and community engagement have become, uh, I think, an integral part of uh, professional practice, yet all too rarely uh, do these engagements uh, reach the upper tiers of uh, what Sherry Arnstein's described as the ladder of participation. Uh, namely citizens' control. Um, in practices of commoning, citizen control is not granted by an authority, but instead cultivated, claimed, and sustained from the bottom up. A control that is evenly distributed through direct democracy and empowers citizens to lead a more self-determined life. Um, and I think one of the most uh, interesting uh, models of uh, direct democracies uh, uh, that also uh, addresses uh, the issues of scaling um, is uh, the sociocratic uh, model, uh, a system of governance which uh, seeks harmonious uh, social environments as well as uh, productive organizations uh, and uh, uh, businesses. So it's interesting that it's actually something that started in the business world but has spread uh, across uh, many uh, of these uh, co-housing uh, initiatives. And I think one of the 
the most important uh, takeaways from uh, sociocracy is that they actually distinguish between consensus and consent. Uh, and the idea of uh, coming to decisions in a group through consent, I think, is so essential because it suggests or implies that we do not erase differences. Uh, so we, we, we can live with a decision in, in, in the, for the sake of uh, our shared interests. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we all agree and are all of the same opinion uh, moving uh, forward. And so I think it is a really important way to kind of acknowledge the kind of the, 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 the also the differences and the kind of ag agonism in, 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 in working and, and, and coming together. Now, while taking control is uh, uh, or, or what I would suggest is that taking control is not just a question of ownership or more democratic uh, uh, decision making, but also one of radical imagination. And I love this image uh, that was uh, circulating uh, uh, in social medias of uh, uh, this winter of the floodings in 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 Venice with uh, uh, captioned with uh, Frederick James Jameson's uh, famous uh, question. Why it, is it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism? And uh, he argued that um, the accelerating cycles of climate crisis, financial crisis, political crisis, and I mean now uh, the, the current health crisis are just as much uh, the product of a crisis of imagination. Our collective uh, inability to project alternative social forms of life beyond uh, the kind of co contemporary uh, kind of power structures. Too long have we been hearing the neoliberal mantra, there is no alternative. But today's proliferation of grassroots initiatives is spurring, I think, uh, radical imagination of this other possible, uh, these other possible worlds. Invoking the image of an iceberg, uh, feminist uh, economic geographers, J.K. Gibson Graham, have exposed capitalist modes of production based on wage labor and private property as the mere tip uh, of a much more significant and diverse economy. Above the waterline in this diagram produce mainstream economic activities that are shaped by monetary exchange. And below uh, lies a kind of abundance of transactions um, and forms of labors that are typically rendered marginal by uh, top uh, tip dom dominant uh, market measures. So reciprocity, barter, gift, informal lending, self-provisioning, all of these uh, are in fact equally uh, defining our everyday transactions and social uh, relations. Now, many of these economic activities uh, are demoted to unwaged labor and are kind of uh, rendered invisible. I think it's, it's really fascinating how uh, everybody says that, um, you know, that the economy has stopped right now, but it's in fact, we're still all kind of uh, working and uh, uh, in the kind of, at least in the kind of social reproduction of everyday life, it's just that we don't recognize that as part of the economy. And um, that, uh, that rendering invisible has actually occurred also with the complicity of architecture. Uh, by confining uh, that, that work uh, to the private domestic sphere in neatly isolated single family homes. Um, that, you know, kind of modernist designers have kind of um, thought to kind of separate uh, life from uh, uh, work and uh, production from reproduction. And I would argue that the making invisible of unpaid reproductive labor is only uh, one example from an entire arsenal uh, of strategies through which capitalism externalizes costs. More commonly, geographic remoteness uh, helps us to render over consumption of resources and environmental devastations and also the exploitation of uh, human uh, labor, conveniently dissociating our actions from immediate uh, responsibility. In response, Gibson Graham advocate for reclaiming the economy and constructing a new language of economic uh, diversity. And so inspired by G G Gibson Graham's work, the Atlas also aims at bringing diverse economic practices to the surface and acknowledge and learn from the daily struggles that have been holding up the tip of the iceberg afloat 
and render visible alternative narratives and models of architectural practice that arise from a diverse uh, economy that really can be found, I would argue, in almost any uh, kind of given uh, social formation. So one example is uh, the start in the mark, a city in the making in Rotterdam, that in a, is an association that is redeveloping vacant buildings into affordable housing, work, and community spaces that are collectively managed. Um, seeking opportunities in areas where real estate markets fail, the initiative leases vacant buildings from developers for a duration of three to 10 years for uh, free, so uh, in exchange for uh, their restoration and maintenance. So instead of capital, temporary users invest sweat equity aiming at opening up spaces for um, alternative forms of uh, working and living in the city. But beyond mere temporary use, um, the city in the making really in, aims at developing a kind of um, um, an alternative uh, financial model uh, in which uh, a kind of um, a circular microeconomy emerges. Uh, by putting latent spatial resources and the diverse skills of its residents to use each uh, little community, uh, and it's a network uh, of a kind of a, a, a growing network of uh, buildings. Um, each uh, community sustains the buildings upkeep, but also maintains uh, affordable uh, living costs. So a carpenter runs a wood shop on the ground floor and helps with the building renovation in exchange for living and working in the building free of charge for the first uh, uh, three years. Uh, but the workshop is kind of then becomes a resource, a shared resource for the neighborhood community. Um, and so there's this kind of, uh, they, they introduce this kind of uh, uh, local uh, modes of exchange that are not based on, on, on monetary transactions. Uh, similarly, uh, Life at City Plaza Hotel in Athens was founded on the collective uh, organization of uh, reproductive labor. Against the odds of uh, you know, a kind of uh, EU-imposed uh, austerity regime and also the kind of you know, constant threat of eviction and kind of rising xenophobia, for a period of uh, three years, the project um, offered a self-determined life in common to 400 refugees that... Uh, together with activists squatted uh, a kind of uh, a vacant uh, hotel. Uh, and here residents and volunteers uh, came together in solidarity um, to share the daily uh, chores of cleaning, cooking, and childcare. And I think what's interesting is that without a cent of government funding, uh, City Plaza residents really were able to put forward a vision for a post-border uh, future beyond um, the degrading refugee camp and detention centers that we are still kind of uh, witnessing uh, today across Europe. In the same spirit, uh, Silvia Federici argues that commoning always starts with a small C. Only if we put the reproduction of the everyday at the center of um, the political uh, struggles, uh, the commons movements will gain the capacity to endure. And I quote her here, uh, she writes, we cannot build an alternative society and a strong self-reproducing movement unless we de redefine our reproduction in a more cooperative way and put an end to the separation between the personal and the political and between political activism and the reproduction of everyday life. Now, for architecture, this, seems, um, this means uh, reconsidering the dis dissociation of the home from the political. The center of communal and political life is not only to be found on the square on, or on streets. The domestic sphere is not limited to the house to house the familiar, but is often the site for the encounter of differences and also controversies. Conversely, domestic activities are increasingly spilling into the public sphere and challenging prevalent ideas of uh, spatial boundaries. And in her research on early material feminist housing experiments, Dolores Hayden has shown that these ideas are in fact not new at all. Uh, and she kind of, you know, in the grand domestic revolution kind of uh, uh, describes uh, many of the kind of late 19th century and early 20th centuries uh, experiments in uh, exploring the collectivization of domestic labors by producing uh, by uh, introducing communal uh, kitchen uh, 
and um, also uh, kind of challenging the heteronormative nuclear families as the sm smallest denominator of community life. The Hull House uh, in, in Chicago is, is, is one of these examples. And um, in redesigning the American dream, then she kind of takes these ideas to also speculate about uh, retrofit retrofitting uh, suburbia uh, by introducing uh, collective um, domestic uh, uh, facilities uh, such as uh, community kitchen. Um, the Dragon Court Village project is uh, one project that is featured in the exhibition in uh, suburban Japan. Uh, that uh, implemented uh, similar ideas. Uh, here, 13 residential units um, are clustered around uh, shared courtyards, uh, disturbing the regular patterns of a, a kind of a suburban subdivision. Uh, and the interstitial spaces uh, in between these micro units offer a common space onto which domestic activities uh, spill out and uh, a life um, amongst neighbors uh, unfolds. This is another model uh, from the exhibition. Uh, at Kalkbreite, a Swiss uh, cooperative in, in Zurich, uh, dwellings are also organized around a, 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 a central uh, common uh, courtyard um, and a wide range of apartment types, including studios, single family apartments, but also cluster apartments um, that I mentioned earlier, challenge uh, this idea of uh, the nuclear family. Um, they deconstruct the idea of a single family household, uh, amongst others, uh, by um, introducing a kind of a, a, a gradational multiplication of kitchens. So, from the private kitchenette to a shared cluster apartment kitchen uh, in uh, these clusters to a bookable professional kitchen and a public cafeteria and a restaurant. And I think that kind of this excess of uh, cooking facilities uh, is also interesting because it it is a way to more casually encourage uh, the collectivization of um, you know the the in this case the reproductive task of of cooking uh, without necessarily kind of being too forceful. So uh, challenging also this uh, idea of kind of you know co-housing taking place in this hippie community where everybody has to get along and, and kind of share everything. Um, the, I think mean, the, the, the most extreme manifestation of this at Kalkbeite is the so-called so super household in which a, a professional chef uh, together with two um, resident uh, helpers every day uh, turn, uh, take turns cooking for approximately 35 members at uh, five uh, Swiss franc a meal. And so the members of this household uh, only have to prepare dinner uh, twice a month. Now, in many practices of commoning, uh, there is an idea also about relocalizing the production and thus uh, also reclaiming control over the means of production and reproduction of uh, everyday life. And I think this uh, shift resonates uh, with uh, an emerging maker culture in which Production will become increasingly local, while design through open source networks uh, increasingly uh, global. Architecturally, this uh, manifests itself uh, also through a strong uh, do-it-yourself aesthetic um, that uh, some of these projects uh, share, and also an idea um, about kind of a more incremental uh, 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 production of space. Uh, one example for this is the urban farm uh, Prinzessinnengärten in Berlin, um, which I think is interesting also because beyond farming, um, it's mostly become a kind of a place of sharing know-how and exploring alternative uh, socio-ecological uh, visions uh, for uh, the city. And in 2015, uh, the community established this neighborhood academy for collective uh, uh, learning. Um, and uh, then felt the need to, in a way, also find a, a more symbolic and architectural kind of expression for uh, a very open-ended structure that they call uh, the arbor, the laube, that was, you know, in a way, this uh, wooden uh, structure that doesn't prescribe any program, but is um, kind of designed to accommodate uh, the academy, the neighborhood's academy's workshop and assemblies um, and all kinds of uh, 
spontaneous uh, spatial appropriation. Uh, and as you can see here, um, the, the, the construction of this project was also uh, kind of um, took place in the spirit of a barn uh, uh, raising. Um, so even the, the, the making of, of architecture is something that is only the, the kind of uh, um, the, the initial um, prompt uh, uh, of uh, uh, transforming the, 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 the built environment, uh, but isn't something that is incomplete, that in, in invites uh, users to then kind of continuously uh, uh, alter and, and, and transform the structure. And uh, I think a similar, uh, in a similar spirit, our urban is a network of uh, resident-run facilities uh, at the periphery of Paris, uh, aiming at building resilience in cities by producing what uh, we consume and consuming what we produce. Um, so an urban community farm and a recycling lab and a unit for communal living all act as civic hubs in a circular neighborhood uh, metabolism that uh, really tries to kind of um, um, localize uh, and construct this uh, circular neighborhood economy and ecology uh, by empowering sitting, citizens to become active prosumers. Now, um, while many of these initiatives that I have uh, shown uh, tend to focus on localization in order to nurture more resilient and sustainable uh, communities, they nonetheless, I think, often have a much broader vision of a kind of transforming society. And you know, I, I realize that this uh, lecture is a bit of a tour de force uh, in, in that it kind of squeezes many projects uh, and many ideas into kind of a single hour. But I think the challenge with many of these projects is that uh, they tend to be dismissed as too small, too local, too marginal for effectively tackling the immense challenges and wicked problems that we face. And so um, our hope is that by bringing these barely visible gestures uh, together, we begin to connect the dots and understand the diverse, sometimes even contradictory practices as part of a much larger transition towards understanding cities as commons. Um, and since it's also so important that this is a kind of an expanding uh, network, uh, I always have this idea of a kind of the rhizome as, as something that, you know, once you have a commons framework, you begin to actually see these uh, practices and initiative actually everywhere. And I think an important uh, uh, task that we can contribute to as designers is maybe also of connecting them. Now, um, I like to end uh, my presentation with a quote from a book um, that had, uh, had a great impact uh, on me and which outlines the possibility of commoning the city even though in 1983, uh, when it was uh, published uh, by Hans Wittmer under the, the, the acronym PM, uh, didn't use the, the, the term commoning yet. Um, and I quote him here, of course there are limits, but why should they be limits of pleasure and adventure? Why are most alternativists only talking about new responsibilities and almost never about new possibilities? One of the slogans of the alternativist is think globally, act locally. Why not think and act globally and locally? There are a lot of new concepts and ideas, but what's lacking is a practical global and local proposal, a kind of common language. There has to be some agreements on basic elements so that we don't stumble into the machine's next trap, the machine being capitalism. In this regard, modesty and academic prudence is a virtue that risks disarming us. Why be modest in the face of impeding catastrophe? Obviously, I think that this provocation is um, maybe more prominent, pertinent than ever. And uh, I think I would argue that uh, now that uh, everything has uh, stopped, uh, also, everything can uh, be put into question. And I think um, the discussions that many of us uh, are having these days is, uh, you know, what kind of normality uh, do we return to? Uh, 
and uh, would we like to return to? And I think this is where, you know, it's really interesting to me that uh, even ideas that are 30 or 40 years old in a way, I think uh, are really important uh, as a kind of, um, as um, a foundation to kind of um, open up uh, kind of, um, the possibilities of uh, thinking differently about uh, how we engage uh, in uh, the co-production of cities and uh, practices of commoning. And I will kind of stop here. I hope uh, this was more or less within the time frame uh, and open it up for discussions. Yes. Uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, Seth, uh, for uh, the, uh, an amazing um, uh, discussion uh, uh, and presentation of, 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 of your work, uh, of your research. But also, uh, I think uh, uh, it was very, very comprehensive, uh, without being exhausting, of course, uh, overview uh, of, of, of commoning. Uh, um, and uh, I'm sure we, 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 we have a lot of questions and comments. Uh, so perhaps uh, I would like to uh, encourage uh, uh, our PhD candidates to, to come forward uh, and to actually have some question or, or, or comments. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for security reasons, uh, we can open the mic all at once. So, those of who want to ask a question, if you just you know pop it in the chat and and we will unmute you. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll start. Uh, so, I will uh, give some some time to those uh, who wants to make questions to to think about it. Uh, um, I mean, one um, very interesting point that uh, you touch in your uh, discussion, which I think would be interesting to elaborate further is this uh, difference, uh, you know, this, this practicing uh, uh, of consent uh, versus consensus, um, which I think is very interesting because it, it, it really has a lot of implications, legal, uh, not only actually factual, but also legal and, and procedural uh, implications. Uh. Uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, I mean, the way actually law is designed uh, in, in, in the, you know, within the modern state uh, is that its legitimacy is based on the, on the preemptive uh, consensus of, that the institution has to propose, uh, to legiferate, to, to propose law. And uh, uh, well, actually consent uh, imply a much more contingent um, uh, let's say, uh, system uh, of norms and, and rules. Uh, and, and, and so I wonder how this uh, practice of consent, in a way, is a way to go back to a pre-modern, um, you know, uh, pre-state uh, forms of uh, negotiation of, uh, you know, what, what actually... In the in the legal jargon, it's called customary law. I mean, law that uh, is not based on 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 the decree from uh, the, the the big institution, but is based on on customary relationships, on on habits, uh, on traditions. Uh, I mean, if uh, habits and traditions uh, can be uh, can be the very ground on which to base consent, because otherwise. Uh, the risk uh, is that consent uh, uh, is understood as a very precarious uh, context mm. in which commoning, commoning practice happens. Well, actually, consent often uh, works through uh, traditions, through customs, through, of course, things that can be changed, uh, but they're not uh, less uh, stable uh, than you know, the artificial ground on which the state uh, relies on its own uh, legal and juridical power. So I, I, I wonder if you can elaborate more on this, uh, on this point, which I found very, very uh, interesting and important. Yeah, uh, thanks. I mean, I, I think you're, you're raising an, uh, maybe a few issues here. So I mean, I mean, speaking directly about this, this idea of consent versus consensus, I mean, this is a notion that I'm, um, I'm, um, I'm building mostly on, on, on Chantal Mouffe's uh, work and, and, and the way she kind of, in a way, kind of uh, 
describes a crisis of democracy um, and uh, makes an argument for what she uh, refers to as uh, uh, agonistic pluralism. Um, and in, in a way, uh, what she argues is that we have come to misunderstood uh, democracy uh, as something that is based on consensus. Um, but that um, in a way, um, there is an implication of, as I mentioned, kind of erasing differences through uh, consensus. And that in, in the, the very idea of, uh, of democracy is, is a, 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 a way to uh, 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 disagree and kind of uh, carry out and work through differences without going to war, right? And, and she, she, in a way, would argue that um, um, the, the very character of the political is something that is so essential to us that there is differences, that maybe the most scariest thing that we can imagine is once there is no differences anymore, right? If, if, if we all agreed, we would be in a totalitarian state, right? So the, 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 the maintenance and nurturing and the kind of the welcoming of differences is, is in a way the very heart of the, the project that is... Uh, democracy and that, that, that in a way I would also argue is the political project that is the city. Um, um, and so um, I think this has, has kind of maybe um, also um, a, a number of impl implications uh, with uh, how we think about commoning. And ma maybe I should also say in a parenthesis that you know, uh, Chantal Mouffe in a way doesn't make this argument in relationship to the commons. She's a a strong kind of uh, advocate of uh, the state and reclaiming the state. Um, and um, as I think, uh, I mean, as, as far as I, 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 I can tell, a kind of a more ambivalent uh, kind of uh, relationship to the idea of uh, uh, um, um, the, the, the grassroots kind of character of the, the commons, it, it, in, in part because she, 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 she believes in the, in the necessity of the, in the power of the, the, the state in, in kind of redistributing um, uh, wealth. Um, but I thought that there was um, another aspect in, in your question that uh, I think is really interesting, um, and it's a question about habits and traditions in relationship um, to uh, consent. Um, and I think this is this is one of the reasons why uh, Silvia Federici's work is so important to me because she sit situates commoning in the kind of almost banal kind of uh, everyday practices, right? Uh, and in a way, I mean, she doesn't, I would say, probably doesn't spell it out this way. This is more my reading of uh, her work, but I would argue that she describes something where, you know, the, the, the kind of daily patterns and routines of our everyday life, um, ultimately kind of then um, they, they, they begin to crystallize over time and they begin to um, define our social relationships and then uh, are turned into uh, more or less formal institutions or traditions uh, and eventually maybe also kind of are cemented into kind of our architecture, right? But I, I think what is interesting about that uh, for me is to really kind of... Um, see that maybe architecture actually doesn't begin when we design and build, uh, but it really begins with these uh, casual everyday relationships that we have. And if we want to um, explore the possibility of another architecture or another type of architecture, modes of architectural practice, I think we really also need to go back to our everyday and questioning these, these almost kind of banal gestures that, that we have. And, and reflect more critically about how they all kind of add up uh, and uh, um, begin to kind of crystallize in, in, into uh, things that we could uh, refer to as habits uh, that obviously has, a, in, at least in French, a very uh, strong relationship to the habitat and uh, therefore also the making and the production of spaces. Uh, actually, uh, I'm seeing that there are, there are some questions in the chat, but uh, before be, before that, I would like to um, just make another small question. Um, I mean, one of the very important aspects of, of commoning, of course, is, is, is very much the um, 
the sphere of care. Uh, I mean, as you said, the sphere of, of, of daily uh, routines and daily actions and how they crystallize and how they can become the, the starting point to create uh, conditions of commoning. Uh, uh, at the same time, our own life uh, has become incredibly dependent on global uh, infrastructures. I mean, logistics, for example, uh, even computing. I mean, uh, you know, we, it's funny because now we are, like, you know, talking about commoning, but we are doing it within uh, a platform that is actually orchestrated <laughs> by all kinds of global transactions of which actually we just don't have access, but we even don't know anymore how they work. I mean, how, you know, what is the mechanism behind all these things? I mean, one of the, my colleagues said that the fundamental principle, for example, of logistics is ignorance. I mean, the, the whole project of logistics is based on making us ignorant about how, you know, all these infrastructures uh, works. So I'm wondering whether, you know, commoning has a scale, you know, that, that as you said, it's it's of course it has a global uh, outreach, but somehow is very much rooted into local practices. And I wonder if if this issue of scale and also the fact that commoning practices require a certain empathy and care among the commoners, whether you know the city or the global city or the you know the urbanization can become a very hostile um, you know condition. Uh, that somehow, um, you know, practically and, and, and from a point of view of infrastructure makes actually the commoning uh, impossible without actually the, the kind of sizing of the means of production to, you know, to go back to the uh, Marxian uh, hypothesis. So I wonder how you would uh, articulate this relationship between, on one hand, commoning practices and the large scale uh, apparatuses of global logistics? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th th that's why I'm ending with this, the local and global as a kind of almost a, a necessary premise, because I think that, you know, um, and this has also been maybe a kind of a filter in the selection process of projects. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, I think, uh, really kind of uh, beautiful and uh, inspiring uh, initiatives uh, that remain very local, right? And But then always, I think, uh, run the risk of becoming this niche uh, that in a perverse way, you know, is the exception to the rule and almost kind of uh, reinvigorates the kind of ex existing kind of system, right? So this is kind of a, an internalizing critique, uh, if you'd like. Um, and so um, I think the question, you know, is there an ambition to uh, kind of then um, create new kind of forms of um, infrastructure or a system that, that actually can kind of scale up or at least be kind of lead to more kind of systemic uh, kind of base transitions, let's say, I think is a, is a really important one. And sometimes I think this happens more deliberately than other times. Um, but nonetheless, I think that um, that is an important question. Now, I, for, for me, I mean, your question also brings me back to the, the hypothesis of the network, right? I, I really think, and, and you know, I, I, in the meantime, I've also read your, your uh, essay about the idea of the islands. Uh, mm -hmm. As a, as a model that, in a way, the island is something that is always local, but because of its spatial character, uh, is always has always engaged with the other. It's always a kind of also an interface to a much more global uh, work. The island cannot exist on its own, right? Of course, of course. And so I, I think this is a really beautiful spatial um, kind of uh, image. Uh, also to think about this relationship of uh, networks um, and um, an encouragement, I, I think, to maybe kind of uh, really attempt to also build that, that um, kind of a, a support structure or kind of a, a solidarity network among, weave a, a solidarity network amongst these uh, initiatives. I think 
I, I think that the, the, the problem, of course, is that uh, especially the ones that emerge out of a, uh, a struggle for survival are, are so kind of, um, I think, burdened with the everyday that's often it's kind of, you know, an exhibition like ours feels almost kind of like um, it's questionable. Its necessity is questionable because uh, they, they have other kind of much more urgent uh, kind of challenges. Uh, but my hope is that, you know, by hosting also a whole series of conversations like this one and uh, kind of exchange uh, events uh, within the kind of traveling exhibition, we can actually bring people together and kind of at least make a modest uh, kind of uh, contribution in, in connecting uh, and, and weaving uh, this uh, network. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Stefan. Uh, so, Lucas. Um, yes, uh, I wanted to say thank you for, for joining us. And I guess I, uh, I really quite enjoyed actually your tour de force, as you put it. But I, my, my question is more technical in the sense I'm interested in, in employing or producing uh, an atlas um, as an approach. And I think when I kind of, I'm trying to grapple how you use that approach to target an audience. And I'm wondering whether your audience is more designers like us or, um, or policy makers and how you can sort of reach this audience through the Atlas specifically also because you, um, trying to sort of situate the, the network you situated yourself in. You, you taught a course at Carnegie Mellon, as I understood you, um, you guest edited, uh, an issue of a journal Arcus, I think. And you also exhibit, um, um, you did in Pittsburgh, which I think you're hoping to tour. So how are you sort of using these three activities and, and um, uh, forms of output within the, um, this Atlas approach? You mentioned as your original reference, I think, uh, Warburg as uh, the memory Atlas as a, as a technique. Did you have other type of references and what are the roles of these sort of three modes that you're uh, employing? It's a very technical question in a way, but um, that would be interesting if you could expand on that. Yeah, thanks. So, um, I mean, I, I think that um, it, in a way there's multiple audiences that um, are also not all addressed with the same, um, I guess, formats or, or, or media, right? Um, I think one kind of primary one as a kind of educator and kind of uh, uh, academic is, is, is to uh, introduce the commons discourse uh, to architecture and arch I mean, kind of future architecture generations um, and to use that as a framework to kind of, in a way, uh, rethink, rethink our modes of uh, architectural uh, practice. Um, but I think that one thing that uh, we are trying to do, and I mean, quite honestly, is not easy, is to really also uh, see um, uh, the, the work that we do as a mode of exchange, right? Uh, and um, this is, um, you know, more or less successful, but when we kind of engage uh, local initiatives, we all, I mean, we try to see, um, you know, we, we're kind of cautious of uh, be going into kind of an extractive mode where, you know, we as scholars come in and study uh, the, the initiatives as a kind of a, an object of, uh, of research, uh, but also um, kind of try to understand what uh, they might possibly get out of this relationship. Uh, and um, that exchange can kind of, I think, have very different uh, also, again, formats. Um, uh, some of them are about sharing knowledge. Uh, so, uh, for instance, um, at uh, around the opening of the exhibition in Pittsburgh, we uh, organized this open space uh, symposium. It's a it's a symposium or a workshop, a day long one where there is no agenda. There's no not kind of a, a given. Um, you know, like we, we try to avoid that we as a kind of a, a university kind of uh, uh, established. Uh, the, the, the kind of agenda, but uh, it's it's a format. Uh, I mean, if if you're not familiar with this, as I would encourage you to kind of uh, look it up. Uh, where in a way the the, the participants uh, bring an agenda and then kind of self-organize in, in in different kind of groups to kind of uh, articulate uh, the, the 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 modes and and the issues uh, to be discussed. 
Uh, and I'm just using this as an example. Uh, you know, this was a format that that really tried to, in a way, kind of um, just provide a framework, and then hear what the local initiatives cared about. I mean, what you know, some some people. I mean, they would volunteer there uh, a couple of hours, and and we wanted to make this meaningful, and not uh, kind of uh, have it um, kind of determined by uh, you know our kind of. Uh, um, our university lens, let's say. Um, I mean, maybe lastly, I think what what I what I would like to um, mention is that um, as we were planning uh, the, the the Mexico City kind of iteration of this, uh, we were also uh, kind of reinventing in a way what it would mean because. Uh, to a certain extent, the, the, the two first iteration of this uh, traveling exhibition were easy because the one was in Berlin, where Eich Plus is uh, based, and the second one was in Pittsburgh, where I am based. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, we, have, we had a kind of a much better uh, understanding of the, the local uh, milieu, let's say. Um, and so we were really keen on, uh, we were going to have a three week workshop with uh, uh, a partner university and, and a kind of a group of other um, uh, initiatives to, 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 to really kind of, uh, I mean, we saw ourselves more as a kind of a facilitator um, that provides a platform rather than kind of um, drive the agenda. And again, with the, with the, the invitation to also kind of be hijacked or kind of dispossessed in, in what we put forward. I mean, one thing that I didn't talk about uh, in, in my presentation is that, you know, and uh, also an awareness that, you know, the whole idea of an atlas uh, has a different connotation that is kind of embedded in a kind of a colonial history of mapping the world and claiming uh, territory or land and also claiming knowledge uh, and so on. And the kind of dilemma that we, we faced when we started this, uh, that you know, we entered this conversation uh, from a very Eurocentric uh, perspective because that's where our roots are. And you know, I think it's important uh, to mention that uh, the group of students that I, I worked with, and I actually see Pure here uh, as one of our uh, members. Uh, she she worked on this project since the beginning. Um, great to see you. Um, so we had a really international group, but nonetheless, you know, CMU is a private uh, uh, university that is very privileged. So I think that we we at least hope to kind of that by by seeing this more as a kind of a, a f invitation of a platform for discussion that that we will not necessarily also control where it, where it goes, but uh, it, it might take us to places that we are, we can't even imagine. Um, I hope this answers your question. Okay, so uh, I see some uh, people. Joanna, I think. Uh... Okay, so good one, Joanna. Yes. Hi. Hi, this is Joanna. Thank you very much for your uh, lecture. Um, it, it, it was really um, interesting to me as my, the, the very heart of my uh, PhD research lies in uh, many of the points that you raised. Um, I'm, I'm trying to detach domestic privacy and the idea of being private from um, from private property and also from the bipolar uh, relationship to the public um, and to somehow reinstate the right to privacy as the right to the city as a civic discourse. And uh, um, what has been revealing to me from my research is that there is um, uh, that uh, the state has constantly undermined um, use rights or rights of access against ownership rights. Uh, for example, uh, uh, most of the, of the public spaces that we're actually using and have access to are the ones that are legally uh, defined um, in terms of assignment of public use mm -hmm. um, against those um, e uh, equal amount of, of public assets um, which are defined um, um, in terms of um, a public uh, property uh, to be managed um, to the public interest, which is a very uh, um, suspicious uh, notion, and therefore is the, uh, these are the assets uh, which are most commonly privatized or exploited on the market. 
So um, what I what I'm trying to to say is that there are many rights, civil rights, that citizens are not aware of uh, that they can claim. And I was wondering, since you mentioned so many um, um, interesting cases of, of commoning, uh, from your experience, is there um, uh, an equal accompanying uh, um, um, policy making rigor that would somehow establish or recognize these rights that are once, you know, uh, won by a group of people, so that they they are like um, uh, established as as civil rights. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I really appreciate the way you're talking about this. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, immediately I was also thinking about examples like Sukoti Park, right? Which uh, the the Occupy Wall Street uh, kind of movement was only possible because it was actually a private park yeah. uh, and therefore you know the, the, the private owner had to kind of give their uh, consent for the police to intervene and uh, so I mean I, I, it's just one example and maybe another one is that I, I've been working here in, in, in Pittsburgh on um, the adaptive reuse of a vacant uh, elementary school uh, and we've transformed the schoolyard into a, a playground now in the U.S., I mean, uh, playgrounds are deadly uh, because, you know, uh, American society is kind of paranoid by being sued, right? So it's like, a, and so in, it, it, interestingly enough, we are able to actually produce uh, or create a, you know, in Europe, you might call an adventure playground, something that is actually much more kind of in, 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 intriguing because it's actually a privately owned uh, kind of uh, land, uh, although it is actually publicly used and really designed with and for the, the, the community and, and, and the public. So, I mean, I think the, it's just kind of two, I mean, ex examples that, that, that I think really illustrate your, your, your point that is, I, and I think that, you know, obviously the role also of um, I mean the, even the, the, the legal notions of private uh, property and public property vary immensely from from uh, kind of city to city or, or state to state and i, I think it, it really requires um um a kind of careful reading um now um i'm trying to kind of return to your your, your final question um about so Maybe if you could connect some of the of the movements, or, or so to, so to speak, um, or the the examples that you have uh, experienced or collaborated with, did, did they somehow establish or recognize some rights, some civil rights for these groups or for other groups, so that uh, they don't have, you know, to uh, to uh, claim from scratch. Um, in terms of, of uses, maybe that were, were unprecedented for. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 so I totally understand. Is, is any way, and I, so I think your, your question is important because it also, I think, um, points towards the, the almost a necessity at some point in order to sustain these initiatives on the long term for the, the, the state to. Um, at least legitimize or actually even, I mean, ideally kind of uh, support uh, the, the, these, these initiatives. And I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, the, I mean uh, these cooperative housing projects uh, that, uh, that I referred to quite a bit, I, I think that in many uh, cases like Berlin and, and Zurich, they have only kind of began to proliferate uh, once uh, they, that they actually were recognized by the, the, the local uh, the municipal government. As uh, as a value proposition, uh, and I'm not saying necessarily value proposition, uh, you know, in kind of a, in, a, in market terms, but in, on the contrary, kind of understanding that oh, these groups are actually kind of um, introducing a more diverse range of functions into the city that you know developers will not be able to provide, uh, and therefore uh, the, the the city in many cases have. Have began uh, to uh, reserve uh, uh, land in large-scale developments for these groups, because one of the problems, for instance, is that uh, these groups are slow. They cannot, in a way, compete uh, 
kind of even just for kind of bidding on land uh, against uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, the typical market forces, but they are also supporting them in terms of kind of uh, legal advising and, and so on. So I think there is I think many examples. I'm just using the, the kind of cooperative housing um, movement as one in which. Um, Yes, it's led to kind of much a transformation of also um, the, the, the government. Thank you. Any other, it, it maybe also just reactions, it doesn't need to be questions. Should I go? Mm -hmm. yes, do you hear me? Okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm also uh, doing something similar on enclosures and the history of that. So um, in my uh, research, I was um, looking at the levels of abstraction while representing enclosures and the relationship uh, with geometry. So I wanted to know in this reverse um, cycle, would you have, would you see something like this? What is the relationship with commons and geometry and abstraction? Well, what are your toes on that? <laughs> Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, your notion of abstraction and geometry? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, levels of abstraction for me, uh, looking at enclosures, is the um, um, the way land was represented as an outline and the, uh, the value of land was transferred to the ground through this medium. So that was, uh, that, that's what I, I refer to abstraction. Of course, this comes from Ma uh, Mark's uh, real abstraction and um, um, so, yeah, and geometry in the sense of how um, land is, um, is divided and, and tagged as a, with a value and, um, and used as a driving force to create these uh, representations, per se. I don't know if it, if it helps. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm um, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, the the kind of uh, um, the kind of demarcation of of, of land, uh, uh, but also the kind of uh, the definition of uh, land use through zoning. Uh, I think has been, for instance, very much uh, part of that. That separation that I, you know, I, I was talking about, right, uh, between what is uh, a residential uh, kind of neighborhood and, and what is a kind of a, a productive uh, one, and so on. So, I mean, I, in a way, I see uh, planning, uh, at least the way it's understood in, in, in the U.S., urban planning, in contrast to urban design, as as a really important uh, field of intervention and kind of also more creative thinking in in, in a way uh, to begin tackling. Uh, these issues, uh, and I think one of the problems, uh, and at least in the U.S., is that there is such a kind of a, a very sharp division between urban planning and architecture and urban design. Uh, you know, most universities uh, planning is not situated within architectural schools. Uh, I think Columbia is one of the, the few ex exceptions uh, for for that. Uh, and therefore, um, I think there's very little kind of cross fertilization. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I um, I haven't worked on these issues. I I, I, I recognize them as being uh, I think really crucial. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to your work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay, we have now Erika. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing your, your atlas. I found it really interesting. So thank you very much. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about the crisis of imagination you were talking about. 
if we can talk not only about a crisis of imagination, but even a crisis of uh, creativity as such. Since what I am actually studying right now is, is the relationship between the rise of creativity in the 70s as a revolutionary act and the evolution of both creativity and capitalism. So if maybe nowadays we can talk about a commodification of creativity rather than a crisis itself for creativity. I mean, what do you think about it if you have studied uh, this evolution or um, well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the creative class was actually authored uh, and produced at CMU. So I'm aware, very well uh, aware of the kind of uh, the, uh, the problematic history that, uh, you know, the, the whole idea about uh, the creative class uh, has on um, the kind of neoliberalization of uh, 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 the city. Um, I mean, that's why I kind of also carefully step around the, the term of creativity and, and, and I'm more interested in in the notion of imagination that, you know, maybe also kind of resonates with, um, kind of, um, you know, other movements about radical uh, imagination and, 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 and so on. That, that, I mean, radical in the sense of, you know, kind of going to the roots of our kind of uh, social relations and thinking more deeply um, about uh, the forces that kind of structure uh, our everyday lives and kind of our modes of production before we rush to uh, kind of intervene, let's say, and uh, design. Um, can you help me out in terms of your question or where you no, I mean, actually, it was interesting. Uh, since you, I mean, it was that that part of the of the yeah. of your speech that I was, I mean, I was really interested in that uh, because I, I think that actually the ability of uh, rethink our habits, our daily life, uh, is actually the power of. Uh, uh, commoning is, uh, I mean, what makes the difference in between uh, uh, this relationship uh, uh, in between, I mean, yeah, the, the commodification of our life as such uh, and the relationship in between uh, the state, the market and the commoning. So this role of the imagination, if I mean, if, I don't mm. know, would like talk a little bit more about it, but in terms of really the evolution of this thing and how the impact of uh, on uh, yeah uh, of movements and uh, uh, revo and revolutionary movements, especially. I mean, what's their role and the the, the relationship they have with imagination? That it's uh, super. I mean, actually, to me, it looks like it's uh, it's an important tool. Yeah. So I mean, I think that that that's great. Um, I mean, I, I think that so part of the attempt in a way is, you know, I, I mean, maybe like many of you, you know, I, I spent time kind of studying the kind of um, other utopian kind of uh, historic kind of uh, endeavors. And, uh, and I felt that uh, in a way to kind of tackle these issues today about kind of uh, alternative society also requires us to rethink what utopia means. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of possibility of thinking about imagining utopia actually means, and uh, and moving away from a kind of um, you know, this, this top-down idea of utopia as kind of a, a grand scheme, uh, okay. and and therefore, I, I think one um, all the kind of influence was actually uh, Ernst Bloch's idea of the kind of utopia of the everyday. Um, and uh, kind of re reimagining uh, utopia not as a horizon, as something that we will never reach, but something that we move towards to uh, uh, continuously uh, or, or move away. But at least, kind of, it's a it's a vector, right? It's a it's a vector and a horizon. Um, <laughs> as a critique um, of the everyday, in somehow. Yeah, but if we don't know where we we go, we will never get there, right? <laughs> so I mean, in, in order to kind of. Uh, yeah find that vector, we at least need to have that vision. And that's why I always also insist on that, on not just kind of remaining in, in the local and the, 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 the kind of, just the kind of everyday. I think there's a risk of also getting trapped in that and kind of you know, getting lost in just um, 
the, the, the everyday. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing that in the in the chat. Maybe there's one question that I did not address about uh, semi-structured interviews. Um, ah, here we are. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I've done some researches on practices, several practices of commoning, um, and I'm interested in what you said before uh, on the question of islands and how those are connected. To me, the problem of today's practices of commoning is actually the ability to um, reproduce them in the territory or um, connect them together, as you said, it's an agency of our architects is also to connect, it's not only to create. So I'm wondering, um, I, um, the practices that I've studied are still since the 60s or 70s that I've studied in, in some territories are like now seen as uh, islands, but literally like uh, prison islands, like um, ideals that are today well studied, but still like the, the examples of Barcelona and Comú or Rojava are still like um, specific points well explored by many uh, literature experts, but still I don't see the way in which us architects can think as these practices on how we can reproduce them, or I, I would say commodify them. Um, so what's your um, vision or what's your like point of view here? I'm interested. Thanks. But are, are you suggesting that it should be our role as architects to reproduce and commodify them? I think you're muted. Uh, sorry, we are. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm wondering what's your. Um, if I am uh, doing a research on such a practice, I'm wondering how can I go beyond its limits because these practices, these practices of commoning, have limits, and we have many, many examples in Europe. Um, in Europe, uh, in the Mediterranean cities, you mentioned Athens, but there are many of them. Uh, but still, they have uh, limits, physical limits. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, you know, Ostrom argues that actually spatial boundaries are essential for commoning because you need to kind of know, you know, who is part of it because, in a way, as, as com commoning also comes with responsibility and this, you need to know who has responsibility and so on. That doesn't mean that. They're hermetic and they're not open to newcomers, but nonetheless, we need some kind of spatial definition. And in fact, you know, the uh, El Campo de Cebada had still the fence around it because it seemed important that they actually would close it at night. For for instance, that was part of the negotiation with the municipality. So, um, you know, I, I would argue that um, spatial boundaries or physical limits in that sense are actually really important. Um, but um, at the same time, you know, um, I think, I mean, some of the projects I showed, the Prinzessin Gärten in, in, in Berlin, for instance, but there's also the Cotty and Co., which is an initiative about kind of uh, affordable housing, uh, actually in the same neighborhood. They have been really essential at bringing people together. So they have soon realized that in a way, the gardening was maybe more kind of a, uh, I would say a pretext or at least a, 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 a a good uh, medium to bring people together, but that was not the core of their mission. Uh, the, their mission is actually a much more kind of activist and political project, uh, uh, but it helped to have a garden, right? So I would say that uh, it still remained this one place. Uh, so it, it's, it's a, you know, as a place, it has an identity and it is well-defined, but not nonetheless, I mean, I think that it's trying to kind of change uh, the neighborhood, if not the city at large. Uh, so uh, the kind of scaling is not necessarily uh, one that is kind of a scaling up in spatial terms, but uh, 
uh, a scaling that can be in terms of uh, um, broadening the, the, the type of activities and the, the, the impact uh, they have. I, I think on the contrary, I, I would argue that there is also kind of a limit in terms of you know, uh, collective decision making that is very physical, right? Uh, and you know, like sociologists or uh, anthropologists have kind of identified it. There seems to be kind of a natural tipping point at 150 people, right? Also kind of uh, tribal cultures have tended to kind of uh, split and create new settlements or uh, 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 at 150 because at 150 you don't kind of you cannot engage in a kind of in an authentic and real relationship uh, with people on a regular basis and that then introduces scales of hierarchy and of decision making and, and and so on that does not mean that you know they're not interconnected but i i i would say that it's uh, there is something to also a, a kind of a local, like a, a, a spatial limits that I think is important for the, the, the sustainability of commoning practices. Um, Maybe I just want to say a, a small remark following uh, Cosimo's um, intervention. Um, Maybe it's a bit of a provocation uh, to, to you, but also to, to Cosimo and to and to the PhD students. Uh, uh, but I think we sometimes, uh, I mean, of course, there is a phenomenology of, uh, you know, relative insularity of, of commoning practices. Although um, there is this concept of boundary commoning that has been introduced by Massimo De Angelis, which I think is very interesting because boundary commoning is really a way to um, overcome uh, the insularity, not by negating the insularity, but by creating alliances and, and networks, as you, as you said before. But I think we also uh, take for granted, uh, and, and here I'm being very provocative, uh, just for the sake of <laughs> provocation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we take for granted how historically urbanization itself uh, has been geared to prevent the scaling up of any alternative uh, to uh, public-private, uh, you know, property. I mean, you, you know, uh, all the infrastructures that makes our urban world uh, from the system of canals of the Industrial Revolution to the roads network to the railway uh, logistics, these are all being, you know, telephone lines, internet. Uh, these are all infrastructures that were weaponized uh, uh, to, to precisely prevent uh, any form of alternative ownership or, or use. So in a way, uh, the insularity of common in practice is not because this, the people who actually are doing these things are happy to be an island and, you know, they are, it's just that uh, the, the whole juridical apparatus that, that governs us, the logistics uh, of the urban world, we shouldn't forget where the a suppression of common of pre-modern common in practices, and they were really geared to to destroy actually any form of alternative, uh, you know, to public, private, uh, and and the state, and of course, and, and and capital. And also, we shouldn't forget that you know it's the state that has created capitalism. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, without the state, capitalism would remain a kind of niche, uh, you know, kind of uh, market of luxury goods, but is the state that has really created a kind of juridical spatial condition to prevent any alternative uh, form of economy to, to scale up and becomes more, you know, uh, more, more general. So I think the question of urbanization for me remains, and this is actually where I'm myself often a bit skeptical to the kind of Lefebvrean uh, optimism that there is a, a right to the city when we know that the city was designed <laughs> to, not, to not actually being, uh, you know, the city, you know, as an urban machine has been designed to prevent, in fact, that uh, thing to, uh, to happen. Yeah, I think this is really uh, an important uh, point. And I, you know, I mean, I think the, 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 the prevention is one that happens, I mean, kind of, uh, I mean, kind of aggressively, and I mean, literally, but I mean, even I think in terms of the writing of history, right? It's like, uh, I think a lot of these practices uh, have, have been 
intentionally written out of history, uh, and and I, I, therefore, you know, uh, I think also remain ephemeral. Uh, I mean, not just as initiatives, but also in terms of the kind of the the, the collective memory and uh, a, a, a knowledge uh, that, that that we have. I've, I, I mentioned this in 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 uh, one of our previous conversations with with BD. Um, I, I I began actually kind of I stumbled into uh, the commons uh, when I spent some time researching the settlers movement in Vienna um, right after uh, the, the, the second uh, the first world war uh, when when the, the Austrian uh, Hungarian uh, monarchy had collapsed so there was a complete kind of vacuum an absence of the state. Uh, and and uh, because of hunger and uh, kind of uh, and, and so on, uh, Viennese kind of settled on land and developed these really kind of intricate uh, kind of um, uh, guilds and kind of cooperative economy to to to, to build uh, housing, but also grow food and and, and so on. And uh, when you read the history of um, of the settlers movement, it's often kind of been uh, described as a kind of um, as a competition between the settlers and then the Red Vienna as, as a program that was kind of, uh, uh, you know, developed and imposed by the state as a kind of the, the, the state versus the, the anarchist kind of uh, settlers. But in fact, uh, and, and if, if it was a bifurcation uh, where kind of the, the, the settlers kind of failed, but in, in fact, uh, I, I've, always argues with, with others that it's actually the success of the settlers that uh, made the Red Vienna possible in the first place. And uh, the settlers movement success in a way also led to its kind of absorption, right? They were kind of just uh, in a way incorporated into uh, the, the state to, because it was uncanny, right? They were, they were squatting land and they were incredibly successful. And so it was about retaining or reclaiming uh, uh, government um, control, uh, so to say. And so I, I think basically once you study these, um, uh, these, these initiatives, you, you will always see that it's a continuous claiming and reclaiming, right? That it's not, uh, that is, is, is also very um, aggressive and violent uh, or conflictuous. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe we have one last question from Michela, Michela Bonomo. Uh, we should uh, unmute her. Sorry for, yeah, just a moment. Um, uh, if Michela, you can. Ah, no, okay, okay, go out of Yes. Michela? Are you there? No. Okay, so then we have a question from Dorette, which I see. Hi. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I want to go back to the idea of the atlas from which you began. Um, I'm very interested in how um, actually, after your experience of uh, working with a mechanism of the Atlas, was there actually um, a moments where actually it could reshape or reconfigure in itself as a mechanism uh, the relationships of the examples you were given, or does it, in a sense, become more of an archive or an accumulation of projects or like a catalog? Because also by looking at uh, Abby Warburg's Atlas, it's very difficult to understand um, these relationships that are underlying and juxtaposed. And I was wondering after your experience of using the Atlas as a, as a mechanism, whether there were th these moments where actually you could um, more easily understand, um, like reshape these relationships through the Atlas as a, as a tool. Um, yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. Um, so um, I think I've I've been able to teach uh, four studios kind of consecutive over the course of four years uh, working on this. And so I think what's been interesting is that you know we've started by producing the concept of this and then the the, the material for it. But um, in the last two years, um, 
I mean, the exhibition was even on campus and we used it as a place to study and learn. Uh, and so it really became a tool in a way. Um, and, not, and not just a kind of a, a, a product. And that's where I think thinking about these relationships has been actually really fruitful. Um, because, um, you know, students kind of um, enter the conversation with different interests uh, and might kind of just um, um, assemble uh, an atlas that all has to do with urban gardening, right? And kind of a very kind of obvious relationships. But others uh, have found out kind of their own threads that or kind of that, that connect uh, projects that might be much more kind of abstract. Um, and um, in a way, I, I mean, one thing that I've um, learned about the exhibition is that it, it's an exhibition that takes a lot of time. I mean, you know, it's, it's um, yes, you can just walk through it and it looks pretty, but uh, if you really want to engage with the material, the, in the Atlas, there's this takeaway process that the students produce that are these short profiles that in, in a way are also not um, comprehensive by any means. They're more kind of like a, a teaser. And if somebody's interested in it, then they can kind of read more about these uh, in, in, in initiatives. Um, but it takes time because we are not, in a way, being overly... Uh, didactic about these relationships. Uh, it's kind of inviting people if, if they take the time to to find them. Um, and um, and so you know that we had twenty five uh, cases in the first iteration in Berlin, and then we added eight uh, cases in Pittsburgh, which kind of in a way reconfigured everything. But not only did it kind of establish relationship between the local and the international ones, but also within the international one, suddenly we, we discovered new possible kind of adjacencies and so on. So um, I think what is, um, what is very exciting to me is that um, the first two iterations of the exhibition, you know, we produced the documentation and the drawings and so on. Uh, so there was a certain consistency but now we are also trying to kind of explore uh, the degree to which, uh, what is the, the kind of basic denominator that it needs in order to enter that relationship, but how open we can be about the formats. Because obviously, if students from around the world produce these uh, and they're not taught by me, they will look very differently and they should look differently. And I mean, it's an experiment because it might also tip at some point and just fall apart, right, and become very kind of uh, chaotic. And I think this will be a, um, we will have to steer that, that, that uh, navigate that process uh, as, as, as we experience it. OK, um, I think it's two hours. We have uh, really <laughs> had a very generous uh, uh, session, so unfortunately, we have to close uh, uh, our um, our uh, seminar. Uh, I want to apologize for uh, those that uh, put forward questions, but uh, we didn't have time to uh, process them. Also, uh, due uh, sometimes the difficulty from our side to to let's say um, work with this uh, system. I think we will improve uh, uh, the the next uh, times. Uh, um, I really would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Stefan for this incredibly generous uh, uh, presentation and discussion. I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm really I'm so happy that you were uh, with us, although uh, virtually. We really hope to invite you uh, once we will <laughs> return to the physical mode, uh, because I think we can we should really continue this conversation. And as I told you, there is a number of. PhD uh, theses that are very much uh, close uh, to your uh, to your research. Um, I really would like to uh, thank, uh, of course, our um, audience, uh, the PhD uh, students, but also we had a quite quite huge number of guests. Uh, and I hope you will come back uh, to us for our next uh, uh, session, which will be on the twenty seven of May. Six o'clock uh, with Anne Sterz, uh, researcher from ETH, who will uh, present her work on Hannah Arendt uh, uh, and architecture.
and then we will send you actually uh, more information. So, so stay tuned with our uh, website. But uh, in the meantime, I really, really, really want to. I don't know how we how we clap, uh, <laughs> how we express our. I think there is uh, with there the is a function for that in Zoom. Ah, okay. <laughs> so please uh, express your uh, gratitude and appreciation to to Stefan. Thanks a lot for your incredible generosity. Um, and thanks, thanks for having me. I mean, if, if there were questions uh, that were not answered, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm just sharing my uh, my email here. I mean, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to be in, in touch. Uh, and again, I'm kind of uh, thrilled to see that uh, so many um, kind of uh, brains are kind of uh, are working on these issues. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Stefan. And I hope to to see you soon. Great. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.